somewhere. Colwyn, there it is. So we're going to do our talking from here, okay, girls? We just bring, we've brought this nearer so that we didn't sit with this big gap between us. And I've asked John to play Ave Maria at the start and at the end when we leave. There's a selection of shoes. He was asked Jeremy if I can wear some of them. So I'm struggling with his tensions. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I think, John, at 11 you play. Okay. Uh, so I think people will only then come in yeah. and then I'll start the service and then right at the end when we're walking out you can play it again. Okay.
I'll bring it near a few. Good morning and welcome to Christ Church as we gather to give thanks to God for Lynette's life, to pray God's comfort on Colwyn, on Jen and I here, and to Judy, Jen, and to celebrate a life well lived. We're very aware that these past months have been very hard and harsh on Lynette. So there is with some relief and release for her, but we meet because she is no longer with us. So we meet to celebrate her life and give thanks to God for the gift that she has been. There are some friends and family watching the live screen, the live stream, and we welcome them too. 
St. Paul wrote to the young Timothy, we brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then from Deuteronomy, this image of God cradling us as a mother does a child to comfort and to reassure. May you know God's comfort and the reassurance of God's love and presence. The eternal God is our refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. From these beautifully prepared leaflets, I invite you to join me as we stand to sing the first of the hymns, Amazing Grace. Will you please be seated while I rearrange the furniture? A poem dedicated to our grandma. God's garden. God looked around his garden and he found an empty place. Then he looked down upon this earth and saw your tired face. He put his arms around you and lifted you to rest. God's garden must be beautiful. He always takes the best. He knew that you were suffering. He knew that you were in pain. He knew that you would never get well on earth again. 
He saw the roads were getting rough and the hills were hard to climb. So he, w so he closed your weary eyelids and whispered, Peace be thine. It broke our hearts to lose you, but you didn't go alone. For part of us went with you the day God called you home. We will miss you very much, Granny. I'll help you down. Thank you. It is an honour to stand here and share some precious memories of our mother, Lynn. Although she'll be missed by all, we will treasure her memory forever. 32 years ago, we thought we were going to lose her. She slipped into a coma shortly after losing her dad. The doctors told our family that they had never seen someone wake up from a coma like that, lasting longer than three days. But five days later, Mom woke up wanting to know what the fuss was about and saying that she just needed a rest. This was our mom, Lynn. She fought to come back to her family time and again over many years, overcoming the toughest of health battles. And her strength and determination were constantly admired by us all. We were truly blessed to have had these extra 32 years with her. I am so grateful for the way both my sister and I were raised. She was never afraid to be our mother, to put her foot down, to teach us right from wrong, and to encourage us to do our best. She always made sure we knew that we had a mom who cared about us, who believed in us and who would always be there for us, no matter what. She opened, up our home, she opened up her home to all and made everyone feel welcome. During our school days, our home was always filled with friends coming and going. There was always a meal to share. Food was always stretched to accommodate one more person or two or three, as needed, so that they always felt included and welcome. Mom had a big heart. She included anyone and everyone and would never turn anyone away. She was not only a mom to die and me, but she also became a mom to many. Her life was filled with family as we were her most important priority. To watch her grandchildren being born and grow up was the highlight of her world. The hours spent talking to die on a Friday afternoon whilst Matt was receiving infusions or playing with Jess because she wanted to spend time with her. She has written a diary for each of her grandchildren from the day that they were born, writing notes about her thoughts on events they had taken part in and milestones that they had achieved. Being able to leave behind this legacy to her grandchildren was so important to her. She lived every day wanting to be a part of Stuart, Connor, Matthew and Jess's lives. She made many sacrifices throughout her life, but as she was always said, her priority was to do whatever was needed to support and nurture her family. Sorry. <laughs> Mom always made a point of being as involved as much as possible, taking Judy to ballet or me to magic, and being at every performance with Dad, even when it wasn't really their thing. Mom and Dad always did this for us. She couldn't have managed everything she achieved in her lifetime without her closest friends, Barbara, Leslie, and Janet were some of her lifelong friends, dating back to even before Judy and I were born. They were so special to her, and she always looked forward to their visits. The weekends away, we still have the pictures, the playdates, and the many cups of tea will always be remembered. She'd often talk about how important it was to have lifelong friends who knew you and stick by you when things were hard. Mom always took the time to phone her friends and ours on their birthdays, or just to say she was thinking of them. Mom lost one of her closest friends, Debbie, many years ago, and yet still spoke of her often. I hope that Mom's reunited with Debbie, and they're continuing their long conversations again. My mom included amongst her friends, Auntie Stella, who she set up with Dad's brother, e even before the two of them were married. They were friends for over half a century, and Mom always said she was lucky to call Stella her sister. They were there for each other right to the end. To Mom's sister, Jeanette, and her brother, Peter, even though distance was often an issue, Mom was sure to stay in contact. She was grateful to know that her support system included her siblings. She chatted with our Auntie Nettie regularly in hospital over WhatsApp video, 
Unfortunately, Nettie's not able to join today as she fights her own battles in England, but they are joining us with the extended family online. To Mom's neighbors, Heather and Louise, thank you for being there. Mom was lucky to have you, never afraid to get your hands on when needed. And lastly, most importantly, Mom thought she was the luckiest person to have found and married our dad, Colwyn. Having been married for 52 years and shared many more years together before that, Dad was the foundation on which Mom built her family, her values, and the love that was ever present in our home. She was soft-spoken, unless you got on her bad side. She loved unconditionally, and for that, we'll all be incredibly grateful and thankful that she was our mom. Even today, as adults, we still want our mom when we're sick or sad. She was an incredibly strong woman to have dealt with the challenges that life threw at her over the last few years, and yet she fought every day to make it special for those around her. Her strength and her wisdom, as well as her stubbornness, and her love of her family enabled her to get through many trials over the years with positivity and a smile. We love you so much, Mom. We will miss you more than words can say. You will live on in our hearts forever, and we will never forget you. Thank you. The readings have been printed on the program, so I'm going to read it straight from there. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass and leads me to quiet pools of fresh water. He gives me new strength he guides me in the right paths, as he has promised. Even if I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid, Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff protect me. You prepare a banquet for me, where all my enemies can see me. You welcome me as an honored guest and fill my cup to the brim. I know that your goodness and love will be with me all my life, and your house will be my home as long as I live. From Ecclesiastes. Everything that happens in this world happens at the time God chooses. He sets the time for birth and the time for death the time for planting and the time for pulling up, the time for killing and the time for healing, the time for tearing down and the time for building. He sets the time for sorrow and the time for joy, the time for mourning and the time for dancing, the time for making love and the time for not making love, the time for kissing and the time for not kissing, he sets the time for finding and the time for losing, the time for saving and the time for throwing away, the time for tearing and the time for mending, the time for silence and the time for talk. He sets the time for love and the time for hate, the time for war and the time for peace. What do we gain from all our work? I know the heavy burdens that God has laid on us. He has set the right time for everything. He's given us a desire to know the future, but never gives us the satisfaction of fully understanding what he does. So I realized that all we can do is to be happy and do the best we can while we are still alive. All of us should eat and drink and enjoy what we have worked for, it is God's gift. I know that everything God does will last forever. You can't add anything to it or take anything away from it. The one thing God does 
is to make us stand in awe of him. Whatever happens or can happen has already happened before. God makes the same thing happen again and again. We sing the second of our hymns, All Things Bright and Beautiful. <clears throat> Two Sundays back we celebrated Easter and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Easter liturgy. We either have it um, around 10 o'clock at night or we have it at about 5 in the morning. The um, aim is to start in darkness and emerge from church in light. And one of the things that we do is we light this candle uh, which is standing here behind me called the Paschal Candle and you'll see there's a there's a date on it, and it has the Greek letters of Alpha, Alpha and Omega beginning and end to it. And we had a little bit of a moment of hilarity because I was carrying this candle, um, which I lit from the fire that I, we had going, and then um, I had to protect the flame because the wind was a bit gusty. And I sort of have a fair idea of what the backyard here looks like, you know? And I thought that I had sort of cleared the corner uh, to go around it, but unfortunately I miscalculated. I ended up in a bush um, holding, holding this candle. But the powerful thing about, besides the fact that I, I refound my uh, sort of way back to the church front door, 
his coming into this church, which then was in utter darkness. We'd also put out the outside um, lights that we would normally have on. And all there then is, is this one tiny little light in this dark church, an incredibly powerful image of how those first Christians saw themselves, that they had found something that keeps them going through, through the thick darkness. And those first Christians were subjected to persecution, but maybe more misunderstanding. And maybe they were regarded as being a bit silly to believe in someone who the one minute claimed to be dead and the next minute claimed to be alive. It didn't make much sense in a world where they were raised. And yet as Christians over the centuries, we have believed this. We have believed in a God who brings light into some of the darkest moments of our lives, a light that opens a new way for us to live and be. And I suppose that kind of faith and belief is what has kept Christians going for centuries. And I always think, when I think of Psalm 23 as a person who themselves is going or was going <clears throat> through really bad and difficult times. But this belief in a God who will not abandon, he calls God a shepherd and says that if you have God as your shepherd, you have everything you need. He leads me, lets me rest in fields of green grass, leads me to quiet pools of fresh water. So Christians didn't just believe in a God who was real and alive, who walked with them in the darkest times, but Christians also understood that it was incumbent on them to live as those who believe, that their words and actions must reflect this God that they spoke about in the way that they did. And so from very early on in the early church, Christians shared what they had with each other. When someone was going through a particularly difficult and harsh times, they were there to support, to extend compassion, to live love rather than just talk about love. And the girls have hinted that that was the home that was made by their mother, a place of welcome, a place of warmth, a place of embrace, a place where the needy were helped and the immediate were cared for. And these have been the values that people have lived for centuries. It is what keeps the world going. It keeps us believing that human beings have the capacity, not just to destroy, as we've seen these past weeks and months on our television screens, but that even in the midst sometimes of such shocking destruction, there are people who help and care whose humanity is expressed in love and compassion. The reading from Ecclesiastes is a reading which speaks of a person who has experienced probably one of the most shocking losses that you can, that loss that leaves you gutted. Vanity of vanities is how that book begins. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It speaks about, in one translation, the meaninglessness of life, because that's how you feel when someone like a mother has died, someone who has held the center of your life for so long, someone whose first face you touched was that of hers. The only way you could and did relate to the world was through her, and when that is no longer there, then it does feel like your world has come apart. And by the time we get to what I read from chapter 3, there is a, a wonderful kind of a holding and embracing 
a time to be born and a time to die. God sets the time for things. God holds us through things. God is with us in things. It's a wonderful way of understanding that we are not alone and that the things that happen are not random events. That with God as our shepherd, we have everything we need. With God holding us, the things that happen in our lives are choices and events that become full of possibility. It happens as we meet our life partner and the course that our life takes once that happens. It happens when we bring children into the world and we watch them grow. We impart to them the values that we were raised with, the things that matter, the things that give meaning and hold our lives. We remind ourselves that we are not here by accident, but God has willed us into being. We are part of God's plan. God made us. And we gather as the friends and family of Lynette to say thank you, God, for having made her, put her together, set her on life's path. Thank you for blessing her with such incredible courage to face every day when every day presented such challenges to her as well. For sparing her to see her grandchildren born, for nurturing her friendship, some which go back half a century. We say thank you to God for that. But we also say thank you to Lynette for being a light in dark times, for being the glue that hold and holds, holds the family, for being the one who gathered us together as she has today too, to give thanks. And we are here to commit and commend her to the God who made and thought her up. We are here to ask God's peace, eternal rest and blessing on her. And to Colwyn and the girls, to the family, God's comfort. That they may know both God's presence in the way that the psalmist spoke of it. That they may experience God's light even in the darkness as they experience loss. And may they know that they are held through all the seasons for nothing happens in this world without God knowing and at a time that God chooses. May God grant to her eternal rest and to those who loved her most, God's comfort. Amen. I'm going to invite you to join me as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us thank God for the gift that Lynette was, for all that she did and gave and shared, for all that she was. Eternal God and Father whose love is stronger than death, we rejoice that the dead as well as the living remain in your love and care. And as we remember with thanksgiving this your daughter Lynette, together with those who've gone before us in the way of Christ, we pray that we too may be counted worthy to share with her and them the life of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray for her loved ones, for Colwyn and the girls, for the grandchildren, for those who loved her most, who will feel the pain of loss more intensely. Lord Christ, you spoke words of comfort to your friends, Martha and Mary, 
in their hour of sorrow. Give consolation and courage to those who mourn today, that they may find both their peace and hope in you who are the resurrection and the life, for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. And we pray for ourselves. O oh Lord, support us all the day long of this troubled life, until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed. The fever of life is over and our work here on earth is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant to us safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing the third of the hymns printed at the end of which I invite you to remain standing for the commendation and we will end the service with a blessing and then John will play the Ave Maria again which he started the service with. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing, only life everlasting. Into your hands, O merciful Saviour, we commend this your daughter Lynette. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Go forth now on your journey from this world, O Christian soul, in the name of God the Father who created you, 
in the name of Jesus Christ who suffered death for you, in the name of the Holy Spirit who strengthens you, in communion with the blessed saints and aided by angels and archangels, into paradise may the angels lead you. May the martyrs come to welcome you and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem. May the choir of angels receive you. Those who have gone before you welcome you. And where Lazarus is poor no longer, there may you have eternal rest. Amen. And now the blessing. Finally, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good rapport, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things, the things which you have both learnt and received and heard and saw, these things do, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen.